Mr. Juan Fernando Lugres is a Uruguayan diplomat specializing in multilateral negotiations related to the environment, human rights, trade, and regional integration, and currently serves as Uruguay's ambassador to China and Mongolia. He is well known as an art lover with an appreciation for Chinese art, and over the years he's been moved by many Chinese films. What are his most cherished memories from his years as a diplomat in China? As the pandemic continues to ravage the globe, how does he rate the epidemic response of China and her government? Welcome to this installment of Face to Face. All right, so thank you very much for taking the time to receive our interview today, Ambassador. I'm very happy to have you here. Uh -huh, thank you. Okay, so we just had a look around here at the, the embassy. It's really quite beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that from the pieces displayed, you clearly have a very great taste in art, and you've experienced China in great depth. So can I ask you which movies or which cinematic works have left a deep impression on you? Well, actually, I have to say that I try to follow all the blockbusters of uh, Chinese uh, cinema and I try to keep informed on what's going on in the Chinese uh, movie industry. Uh, there are many movies that uh, uh, attract me. Before coming to China there were some very important and celebrated movies mm. of Chinese directors that got the attention of the whole world yes. and of course I watched them all. But since I am here I've been touched by many, many uh, Chinese movies. If I have to name one, I would say that youth was a a movie that really touched my heart. Mm. Uh, it shows not only some you know, turbulent times in, in recent history here in China being presented in a very beautiful uh, manner through the life of artists, but also their evolution until today. And the movie ends up in Hainan with this free trade port uh, yeah. nowadays. So I think it's a, it's a great artistic reflection of the last years of constant change in the Chinese society with an incredible beauty. So that would be my, my choice. Okay, I think it's an excellent choice. And of course, as, as a, a diplomat with quite a decent amount of time here in China, you've seen some changes yourself. And um, so what moments during your time here do you think are most deeply impressed in your memory? Well, so many important moments in, in, in Chinese history that have a uh, also called the attention of the whole world, but yes. I think uh, you know the, the parade, the big parade uh, that we had uh, here. Is this the military parade? The military yeah, parade yeah. was very impressive. Mm. It was very beautiful to be part of that. I mm. think we have all seen them on TV from previous uh, decades, but to have the honor to be part of a, such a huge yeah. celebration of, of this nation was quite quite impressive. And and then you know we have seen uh, a lot of concept being becoming reality, like the Belt and Road. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, before coming to China six or seven years ago, we were trying to understand what that meant to the world and to China. But when we are here, we attend uh, the big summits and we listen to the leaders uh, speaking clearly on, on those concepts. And then we see railways moving to Europe on a daily basis and we see huge ports. And I mean, mm -hmm. everything makes more sense. So uh, I think... Uh, the, yeah, to see the materialization of a lot of uh, important concepts in, in reality, I think this is also something very impressive. And I would say that uh, there are other concepts in China, like the Greater Bay Area project that, you know, it sounds like a big project, but once we see the, the bridge between Hong Kong, Macau, Zhuhai, uh, it's more than a project, it's, it's a reality in many, in many ways. So there are many things uh, during these six years that uh, have been very interesting for me, especially to put a, a, a real image to a concept that I had from before. And, and I think mm. that is something that in China is quite easy to happen because there are many concepts that are becoming realities on a daily basis and there are so many changes ongoing that this is fascinating and keeps us very busy. Yeah, in terms of the whole society moving forward, impressive is the right word. I think you chose that very well. And constant um, change, constant yeah. change and diversity. All those elements are 
are part of mm. the Chinese reality nowadays. That's true. What about uh, your normal daily life? Is there anything particular that you really enjoy about living in Beijing? Uh, maybe the food or the way that people talk or something like this? Well, I, I love Chinese food and I love the diversity of Chinese food yeah. and this fantastic opportunity that we have to move mm. from Sichuan to Yunnan food and one day to the other. Mm. And, and, you know, every night we can say, what are we going to have? And well, let's go for it this food or the other. I think this, this is great because it, it shows the, the complexity and the diversity of, of the country mm. uh, reflected in, in this immense, diverse cuisine. Uh, then I love the city. I have to say that I'm, I'm, a, I'm truly a, a Beijinger who loves yeah. Beijing and I love the temples and I love the old hutons. So to walk around and to discover a new temple or a new little street uh, keeps me also very inspired. So, and I really like uh, the life in Beijing, even though we are extremely busy, because all our countries have uh, very intensive agendas with China, and this is also very uh, interesting and, and, and enthusiastic, but it's, uh, it's, it's also a part of the life here. Yeah, that's right, and I, I understand that you're the head of an association, which is the Latin American Diplomats here in China. Another job as well as your own, to keep you very busy there. Well, this is the, the Latin American and Caribbean group yes. of ambassadors mm -hmm. that we, um, we work together at the UN level and mm -hmm. in every single capital uh, we get organized. So um, I, I have the honor to be uh, nowadays the dean of the Latin American and Caribbean group of ambassadors. And, that's an extra job, but it's a very <laughs> pleasant one because we are representing a, a also a vast, uh, diverse, mm -hmm. uh, immense uh, region full of, uh, of creativity and diversity and natural richness. So it's, it's truly an honor also from, from the perspective of uh, Uruguay to be able to, to work on the integration of the whole uh, Latin American and Caribbean uh, continent and to present it better our Chinese friends. You've been here uh, in China witnessing the entire uh, development and the control of the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. So of course we understand that vaccines and economic recovery are the central pillars of the global effort that continues against COVID-19. And aside from China's own domestic anti-epidemic measures, we've seen that uh, this country has been providing vaccines to numerous other countries. Mm -hmm. And for example, your president, so he was inoculated using China's Sinovac COVID vaccine. And uh, recently you visited Wuhan. You've been to Wuhan quite a few times before. And you may have noticed that the city has also changed a lot over those years. And um, Wuhan has been very impressive in 20 and 2020 and 2021, fighting against the critical threat of the COVID-19 virus. And they achieved victory against this in, at the local level. So what do you think are the elements of Wuhan's and China's experience that could be applied to other countries and regions who are still pushing to achieve victory? Well, several comments. Mm -hmm. uh, it has been quite an impressive uh, moment in history uh, mm -hmm. to go through the entire pandemic uh, cycle here in China. And mm -hmm. I have to reflect that at the beginning when the, the outbreak took place in, in Wuhan, there were so many question marks and oh, so yeah. many doubts and and of course Uruguay was one of the first countries that uh, show its solidarity towards uh, the Wuhan people. Mm. We we sent some little but important donations to, to support the, the fight in Wuhan. Mm. This embassy was one of the first ones to have a, a fantastic uh, a sign out of the of the embassy saying uh, Wuhan, Chaiyo, who were trying to be close to the to the people who were right. really facing a very difficult uh, moment in, mm. in, in, in Wuhan city. We also had some students, uh, Uruguayan students, who, who were part of the lockdown in, in Wuhan and who were treated incredibly well by the authorities in Wuhan. Mm. They could leave the country in one of the first uh, flights, thanks to the cooperation of the French government, I should say. But one of the first elements that I would like to underline is that uh, nowadays here in China we can start talking from a historical perspective ah. because in most of the provinces we are facing zero cases mm. for many, many, many days, sometimes months, mm. and I've been to regions and provinces in China where they have been experiencing zero cases for more than 200 days. Mm. So COVID-19 in a way it's history in some parts of China. Mm. Um, reflections for the rest of the world, I think we can uh, get a lot. But I think the first one that I think it was important was the value 
of science. Um, an outbreak uh, could happen in any part of the world uh, at, at any moment. And I think it was important that China put science immediately to uh, try to understand what was that, and, and then it shared information to the rest of the world. The second element, I think, is um, a very disciplined population that could uh, react according to what the science and the government instructed them to do mm. uh, without hesitating, uh, because they understood that they were uh, working on a, on a public health issue and, yes. and everybody had to contribute to, to that. Um, and I think all that is also related to experience. Um, in China, uh, due to previous outbreaks, I mean, there was an experience. And, and in Hong Kong and Guangdong, uh, yes. the SARS was really, really central. For the rest of the world, SARS was something that took place in Eastern Asia. But, yeah. uh, but many people in Uruguay didn't really have memories of the, of the SARS outbreak. So I think um, having that in, in, in mind, helped many people in China also to understand that to wear a mask is, is essential. Mm -hmm. It's the uh, number one thing you have to do in order to protect others, even when you get a flu. But that was a concept that for the rest of the world, people had to explain and, and, and scientific committees had to develop papers yes. to convince people that mm -hmm. that was a, an important measure to be taken. So I think this experience that uh, China had, this clear access to to scientific information and the discipline of, of people in, in obeying what, uh, what the science plus the government is telling people to do mm -hmm. are remarkable uh, things. Mm, fair enough. May I ask, uh, uh, so of course it, there are a lot of lessons that can be learned. Do you feel that Uruguay has um, learned some of those lessons and improved its response over this time since? I think so. I think the government took a, a very smart decision to establish a scientific committee uh, in order to get um, scientific information on, on first hand. So mm -hmm. the government has been applying a lot of measures uh, based on what the scientists are saying. And I really hope that this is a lesson learned because I think um, even in normal circumstances it, it would be important to have the science closer to the political decision making process. So I think that should be one uh, asset for, for the future, to, to try to listen more to scientists. And, and some beautiful consequences is like we are getting more and more people uh, studying science and studying biology, studying medicine, because I think uh, also to understand how important it is to have people in labs, understanding viruses, protecting human health worldwide, has motivated more people also in Uruguay to study mm. sciences. And this is a good thing. There are other good things like e-commerce and then uh, online education and Zoom uh, fever. So I think those are some of the elements that we're going to get a lot of uh, yeah. lessons learned and hopefully positive ones. This year marks the centenary of the Communist Party of China, just as its Uruguayan counterpart also celebrates 100 years of history. Let's hear what special wishes the ambassador has for the CPC. What are his expectations for the Beijing Winter Olympics to be held in February next year? In which areas will future cooperation between China and Uruguay be concentrated? Face to Face continues. I think what you said is correct, that the, the place of science in our society and in our discourse has been, become more important, and people realize that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a, a, a positive outcome. From all sure. of this. Yeah. Okay, so during the recent trip to Wuhan, you made some visits. One was to the 1911 Revolution Memorial Hall and also to the site of the August 7 conference. So these are very important historical sites, of course. You saw up close the amazing achievements of the Communist Party of China over its 100 years of existence. And uh, I would like to ask you to offer a message of congratulations and best wishes. And also, could you discuss your views on the CPC and its 100 years of history? I think this is a very special year for, for China. And, mm. and it's a great opportunity for, for Chinese people to reflect on, uh, on China's uh, historical path. Mm. And I think it's a privilege for a foreign diplomat to be here and to listen to all these uh, celebrations and all these reflections. And I think it's a, it's a great invitation for Chinese people to reflect on their own uh, historical decision to to move towards a, a new a new system, and, mm. you know, foreign 
uh, diplomats, we, we are trying to understand better uh, China's history, which is immense, uh, because it's very vast and, and we have to understand uh, dynasty to, to dynasty, yes. and, and, and sometimes it's, it's really complex. And recent history is also complicated. And, and the re very recent visit of the Latin American and Caribbean group to Wuhan offered us this fantastic opportunity to see some of the historical places where first the Republic of China and then the mm. People's Republic of China was created and, and, and elevated to a, new, to a new level. And I think uh, through those visits we can understand also better the, the complexity of those historical moments mm -hmm. that really marked uh, not only China's history but the world history. And I think these hundred years of, uh, of transformations in, in China uh, have been extremely dynamic, extremely mm -hmm. fruitful in many, many ways, um, but they have been a dramatic change for the world. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we that we need to, to understand. So yes, congratulations to the Chinese people on their own decisions to to change their own history and and of course uh, the most important thing is to to remain uh, very close to those political processes to see uh, how they would continue to evolve in the future. Because mm -hmm. at this moment there is a clear strategic partnership between Latin America and the Caribbean and China and between Uruguay. And China, mm -hmm. our economies are extremely complementary. Uh, China is our first trading partner, so we need to to follow what what China is doing and what what are the changes in in China's uh, uh, system in order to understand better and to be a better partner for for the future. Okay, and what would you like to see in China's future? What do you think is the next step? Oh, I think mm. transformations are ongoing and, mm. and, and I really hope that China could continue to, to keep this path of, of, of dynamic transformations and, and, and I think there are three pillars that are fundamentally important for, for the sustainable development of, of China that I would like to, to see the, the three of them equally uh, moving fast. Uh, one is the economical development that I think there, there's no doubt uh, out there that China will continue to grow economically in a new way, uh, with, with new technologies, with new transformations. So I really hope that uh, this uh, pillar will continue to, mm -hmm. to evolve. But next to that pillar, I think the social development has been uh, amazing in mm -hmm. the last hundred years in this country, and the poverty eradication and, and the elevation of the middle classes. And I sincerely hope that this uh, this trend will continue and will continue to evolve in the same way because uh, that uh, offers a lot of uh, new opportunities to people, more mm. access to, to culture, to sports, to uh, different uh, woods and, and, and services. So I think this is a, a very important pillar. And the third pillar that is absolutely fundamental is the environmental protection okay. one. So if we are able to see that China continues to evolve in the in the three pillars of, let's say, at the same time. And uh, I think it would be uh, very good news, not only for Chinese people, but it would be very good news to the world. Because every time China uh, expresses its willingness and commitment to fight climate change, to protect biodiversity, to work on environmental issues, it has an immense impact in the globe. And, and all those issues are of global concern, it affects us all. So it is important to see that the society continues to uh, grow economically, uh, evolves socially, and uh, protects its environment. And, and, and that makes sustainable development a reality. And it's very important that the most populated country in the world continues to grow uh, in a sustainable manner. There's another very important national event going to happen in China next year. It's also very important for the world, of course, which is the Beijing Winter Olympics. So I would like to know how are the Uruguayan national team preparations coming along and what goals do they have their, set, their sights set on? Well, I have to be very, very honest. Uruguay doesn't get any snow, so our, mm -hmm. uh, we are not strong in, in winter sports, but we are a very good friend of China and we uh, think this is going to be a very important event. So our goal is, is a very modest one. We would love to participate. And we are trying to find out uh, Uruguayan sportsmen and women uh, who are um, Uruguayan, but who are uh, practicing uh, winter sports in other places in the world uh -huh. because Uruguay doesn't have any, 
any winter sport uh, yeah. area. Uh, and of course, we do have Uruguayans uh, doing winter sports in, in Chile, in Argentina, in mm -hmm. Europe, in, other, in the US and other places. So at this moment, our Ministry of Sports, uh, that depends directly from the Presidency of the Republic, is trying to identify uh, some sport men and women that could mm -hmm. come and, and, and be part of this celebration. And I think this celebration is going to be quite an important one because uh, we all hope that this uh, Olympic Games would also mark a post-pandemic, uh, the beginning of post-pandemic world. So let, mm -hmm. let's hope that things are going to happen, that the vaccination campaigns worldwide would advance um, in, a, in a positive manner and that we could have uh, those celebrations of the Olympics, um, the one in Japan and the one in China. I think that would give us a lot of hope uh, as humankind that, you know, that we can really have a victory on this virus. So do you have any suggestions for um, uh, the organization or delivery of the Games next year in Beijing? Do you have any ideas? Well, I think Beijing has an extraordinary experience in, mm -hmm. in uh, hosting uh, big events, among mm -hmm. them another Olympic yes. that was uh, that was very successful. So I think this is a unique city that could host uh, Summer Olympic Games and Winter Olympic Games. And, and I, I don't think I have many suggestions <laughs> to, to them. But I would like to add some words on what you just said. And, mm -hmm. and the president of Uruguay has been very instrumental in, in supporting the Confederation of Football in South America mm. to get Chinese vaccines in order to prepare our big uh, events in Latin America oh. in terms of soccer, which mm. are the most popular ones yeah. in, in the continent, and to have them in a safe manner. So Sinovac uh, is going to be a, a very special uh, sponsor and partner of the America's Cups this mm. year and all the tournaments that we're going to have in, in Latin America in order to ensure that our, that our people can be back in stadiums and our teams can play in a, in a safe manner. Mm. So it is difficult to have uh, those big events uh, during still the, the pandemic. But let's hope that the Winter Olympics are going to be the beginning of the post-pandemic and, and that we can be very safe uh, in Beijing. I'm sure preparations are going to be brilliant because yeah. we are very used to see uh, fantastic big events and global events being very well organized here in mm. China. Okay, so despite the fact that we're on opposite sides of the globe, China and Uruguay are very, very closely connected. Mm -hmm. And during your six years posted here, the two nations have covered a lot of ground in terms of political, economic, cultural, and interpersonal engagement. So as ambassador, you have worked very, very hard to continue the advancement of trade relations, even as the pandemic has been unfolding. So in your opinion, what do you think would be the, mo the main focal points of a bilateral cooperation between China and Uruguay over the next five years. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much mm -hmm. for that, that question. Uh, our strategic partnership is arriving to a, to a mature state mm -hmm. and, and this is very encouraging. Uh, I personally believe that we are ready to, to move forward into a, a more elevated uh, mm -hmm. status of the, our strategic partnership and, and to have uh, very uh, strategic cooperation in, 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 a, in a more um, sophisticated manner. And that mm. means that we need more uh, educational cooperation, we need more planning of our, our strategic partnership, we need more scientific centers to do research uh, together, mm -hmm. uh, we need more deep uh, cultural uh, exchanges and, and cooperation. And of course, we need a more sophisticated uh, economical uh, cooperation. So all the different aspects of our relationship are, are mature enough to be elevated to a new level and in a comprehensive strategic partnership. And that's why we think that um, a visit of our president, uh, President Lacage to, uh to China would be instrumental in order to push on, on this idea. And we are working hard on that. Our president is, is ready to come as well as our Minister of, of Foreign Affairs. And we really hope that uh, we can recover our connectivity and that we can have a, a safer uh, moment in order to allow those visits to happen mm. um, because they're going to be very important uh, to push on, on the vision of President Lacalle and Minister Bustillo 
on the bilateral relation with, with China, which is absolutely strategic uh, due to the fact that our economies are so complementary and, mm -hmm. and, and so integrated at this moment. Okay, and then I just follow up. And is there any particular field or particular industry that you feel has the potential for be, uh, dramatic growth between China and Uruguay? Yeah, we, we, we see a lot of opportunities in, in many sectors, but let me give you an example. When mm -hmm. I came here, our exports of beef uh, to China were growing. Now they have exploded and oh. we are exporting. Oh, it's, it's good. So. <laughs> it, it, it's really say? good. And, and we're exporting more than 60% of, wow. of our total beef to China. Mm. Another example of a, of a sector that has been extremely successful recently is the forestry one. Mm. Uh, we are seeing uh, a very important growth in the, in the last years. Um, so those are some of the key uh, sectors of, of, of Uruguayan agriculture and I, I truly believe that we have um, a lot of uh, space to grow. But also Uruguay is a country of services and we are the number one exporters of uh, software per capita in Latin America and mm -hmm. the Caribbean. We have a lot of brilliant uh, startups. Uh, some of them are already in Shenzhen and they are doing very good cooperation with mm -hmm. some uh, friends in, in China, but this is really the beginning. 75% of the software produced in Uruguay goes to the US. Probably because we are in the same continent, because oh, yes. we speak English easily or, or more than Chinese Mandarin, but I truly believe that this is a sector that has to have more contacts with China mm -hmm. and that young, brilliant people on, on both parts of the globe should cooperate more and, 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 and bring new ideas together. And I really hope that it's not only about agricultural sectors where the complementarity is obvious, but it's also about uh, creative people doing things together. And, and I think for that we have an immense space for cooperation in the future. Thank you.